Before we begin the, me- begin the message, I want to actually start out a little bit differently. Uh, there is a prayer um, on my office wall by the door, my door. And I put it there to remind me to pray it. Uh, you might call it my mezuzah, a uh, little Jewish box on the door frame of Jewish homes that reminds them to pray. Anyway, the prayer is this. Lord, show me the extent and depth of my sin so that I may understand the necessity of Jesus' sacrifice and the breadth of your gracious love. Lord, show me the extent and the depth of my sin so that I might understand the necessity of Jesus' sacrifice and the breadth of your gracious love. I put that prayer by my office door because I want to know my sin. Uh, I want to know my sin not so I can feel sorry about myself, but so I can worship Jesus, who forgives me for it, and so that I can cooperate with the Holy Spirit, who wants to rid me of it. And that's a prayer I invite you to pray with me. Lord, show me the extent and the depth of my sin so that I can understand the necessity of Jesus' sacrifice and the breadth of your gracious love. Honestly, this is not a prayer that many of us want to pray. Many of us do not want to take a hard look at our sin. We don't want to see what God might show us. We know we are sinners, and we know that Jesus died for our sins, but let's just leave it at that, right? But we can't just leave it at that. If we really want to grow as Christians, we have to understand who we are as sinners. So while painful to have face to face, so while, pain, while it might be painful to, to have to face up to our sin, I think it's important that we do so if we have the courage. So I invite you to pray this, pray this prayer with me. I dare you to pray this prayer with me. And I invite you to pray this prayer for yourself, not on behalf of somebody else. Lord, show my friend her sin. <laughs> Not that. You see, when it comes to sin, this is often what we do. We like to talk to God about other people's sins. Lord, I don't want you to tell me about my sin. I want to tell you about my husband's sin. But here's the thing. My problem is not your sin. Your problem is not my sin. My problem is my sin. And I don't want to be a sinner. I hate being a sinner. Does anybody else just hate being a sinner? I hate being a sinner. And to be sure, I'm not. Theologically speaking, I'm actually a saint. I'm a saint made righteous in Christ. But I'm a saint who sins. And I hate sinning. But I sin every day. And I want to know how. I want to know when, so that I may understand the necessity of Jesus' sacrifice and the breadth of God's gracious love. This is the rationale behind the series that we're in right now. The series is called Sin, What Is It Really? And I picked this series, you know, we pick series on purpose here. And I picked this series because I had had this hunch that this is something we just need to think about. The gospel we preach here at Rooftop is God's love for sinners, seen in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. But in order to really grasp the depth of God's love, we need to understand what it means to be sinners, or rather... Saints who sin. And in order to do that, we've been looking at the way sin is characterized in the Bible because sin is a theme in Scripture. Now, sin is never really defined in Scripture, but it is described. It's described using stories and pictures and images. And according to the Bible, sin can be thought of in different ways. Jeremy has taught us that that sin is is wandering from the path. Schuyler talked about sin as the weight of debt. Uh, We talked about sin as, as misplaced desire last week, rebellion. And this morning, I want to talk to you about sin in another way that is portrayed in Scripture, sin as corruption. That's another way that the Bible portrays sin as corruption. In order to talk about that, though, now... I would like to show you this video. <laughs> Hello, Jeff. Come in. Well, you ever talk to Taylor? He said he'd been telling you what to do for 20 years. I call him a liar. Listen, son. Come over here and sit down. Will you? I don't feel like sitting down. Well, I know how you feel, Jeff. I was hoping you'd be spared all this. I was hoping that you'd see the sights, absorb a lot of history, and go back to your boys. Now, you've been living in a boy's world, Jeff, and for heaven's sake, stay there. This is a man's world. It's a brutal world, Jeff, and you've no place in it. You'll only get hurt. 
Now take my advice, forget Taylor and what he said. Forget you ever heard of the Willet Creek Dam. But you still haven't answered me, sir. Can a man like Taylor tell you and those other men what to do? Now, listen, Jeff, please. And, and try to understand. I know it's tough to run head on into facts, but, well, as I said, this is a man's world, Jeff, and you've got to check your ideals outside the door like you do your rubbers. Now, 30 years ago, I had your ideals. I was you. I had to make the same decision you were asked to make today. And I made it. I compromised. Yes. So that all those years I could sit in that Senate and serve the people in a thousand honest ways. You've got to face facts, Jeff. I've served our state well, haven't I? We have the lowest unemployment and the highest federal grants. But, well, I've had to compromise. I've had to play ball. You can't count on people voting. Half the time they don't vote anyway. That's how states and empires have been built since time began. Don't you understand? Well, Jeff, you can take my word for it. That's how things are. Now, I've told you all this because, well, I've grown very fond of you. About like a son, in fact. And I don't want to see you get hurt. Now, when that deficiency bill comes up in the Senate tomorrow, you stay away from it. Don't say a word. Great powers are behind you and they'll destroy you before you even get started. For your own sake, Jeff, and for the sake of my friendship with your father, please, don't say a word. Well, I know there were no colors or special effects in that old video clip. But it comes from a very famous movie from 1939 called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. In the movie, Jefferson Smith, uh, played by Jimmy Stewart, he's a small-time community leader. Uh, and when a, the U.S. senator from Smith's state dies, the governor actually appoints Smith to replace him, thinking that the idealistic and naive young man can be manipulated. Mr. Smith then goes to Washington. He quickly realizes he is surrounded by crooks who use power to line their wallets and bribes to get things done. Smith is reassured, though, that the senior senator from his state, Senator Joseph Payne, is a good and upstanding man. He's known Payne for a long time. But in this scene, Mr. Smith realizes Senator Payne is just another politician. He's corrupt as the rest. Payne even admits as much and explains to the young idealist that in order to get anything done, you got to play the game, you got to compromise your morals, you got to go back on your word. We are all familiar with this seedier side of politics. The corrupt politician is one of our favorite bad guys we love to hate. And with good reason. Our political system is in fact littered with corruption. According to an article in Foreign Policy magazine, for example, corruption in the United States is getting worse, not better. The Corruption Perceptions Index measures such things as untraceable money in politics, misspending, voting problems, nepotism, pay-to-play arrangements. The U.S. currently ranks 25th in the world in terms of uh, political corruption, and it's falling. That's like 10 down from five years ago. And the effects of corruption are devastating. Corruption destroys trust in government. Corruption depresses voting rates. Corruption hurts the poor who don't have the power to get their share. Everybody hates corrupt politicians, even politicians. You know as well as I do, the best way to become a politician is to say you hate corrupt politicians. You're going to go to Washington, and what are you going to do? You're going to clean things up. Oldest trick in the book. We all hate corrupt politicians. Of course, in this sense, you know, you know, we are all hypocrites here, right? The reason we have corrupt politicians at the Capitol is because we're the ones that keep sending them there. And the reason we send corrupt politicians to Jefferson City or St. Louis City Hall or Washington, D.C., the reason we send corrupt politicians to these places is because we're corrupt. If we weren't, we wouldn't necessarily send them there. No, we care more about getting things done for us than about what's right. Corruption isn't just a problem for politicians, it's a problem for everybody. And this is not just Pastor Matt speaking from his soapbox, this is the Bible calling us out. 
You see, one of the many ways the Bible describes sin is as corruption. We read this in the earliest pages of Scripture. In Genesis 6, for example, the author writes, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. Everybody, everywhere, everything was corrupt. The situation was so bad that what God, did God decide to do after seeing that the earth was like this? He decided to destroy the earth through a flood. But corruption endured because Noah and his family were as corrupt as everyone else. They were the ones on the boats and corruption spread. As the psalmist says, everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. This includes the nation of Israel. As soon as God calls Israel from Egypt, they too fall into corruption as we read in Deuteronomy, and God told Moses, go down from here at once because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have turned away quickly from what I commanded them and have made an idol for themselves. I love this verse, by the way. God calls Israel his people most of the time, but when they start misbehaving, God calls them Moses' people. <laughs> Because your people, Moses, your people have started misbehaving. That's what God says, your people. It's like when my kids start misbehaving, my wife calls them my children. <laughs> you know what your son did today? You know what your daughter did today? Why all of a sudden is my child exclusively my child? Well, it's because they misbehaved. <laughs> my wife, shifting blame, just like God, apparently. Anyway, corruption. Corruption is a problem in the Bible. Corruption is a problem in us. But what is corruption? Let's define some terms here. The dictionary defines corruption this way. To corrupt something is to destroy the integrity, of, the, the integrity of it, to alter it for the worse. And we find this meaning in the Bible. The word corrupt actually refers to a family of words in Scripture, words like perverse, deviate, decay. These words suggest the idea of disintegration, deviation from God's ideal, perversion of the perfect. Something that is corrupt has devolved from how it was created to be. It doesn't work like it was supposed to. Uh, think of a computer file, for example. What happens if a computer file gets corrupted? Something happens to the file to break it. It doesn't work anymore. Or think of a corrupt politician. Maybe they worked once. Maybe they sacrificed for the people with integrity, but they gave in to selfishness, to expediency. Now they don't work. Or think of a physical body. The Bible says that our bodies give in to decay and to corruption. A dead body is a corrupt body. It doesn't work because it's corrupt. It dies. It disintegrates. This is what corruption is. Corruption is the perversion of the perfect. The disintegration away from God's ideal. And this is our problem. We have all been corrupted. We don't work like we should. Our brains have been corrupted. Our minds have been corrupted. Our bodies have been corrupted. Our sexual desires have been corrupted. Our marriages have been corrupted. Our churches have been corrupted. Our neighborhoods have been corrupted. Our financial system has been corrupted. In fact, everything has been corrupted. Everything. Nothing works like it should. Everything is perverted. We are all, in some sense, perverts. We've been perverted. The Apostle Paul says this in the book of Romans, all creation, all creation is subject to corruption. The very, very world we live in is corrupted. Our world is off. Our world is perverted. It just doesn't work like it should. Now, how did this happen? How did everything get so corrupt? Well, that's a good question. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the cause of corruption, but I also want to talk about the consequences of corruption. And then lastly, I want to talk about the cure for corruption. There's your outline. Cause, consequences, cure. First, the cause of corruption. How did our world get like this? How did we all get so off? Well, in a certain sense, this is a little bit of a mystery. Uh, the traditional story of Scripture is that God created humanity to live in a state of moral and physical perfection 
but that the plan got corrupted somehow. Adam and Eve, our first parents, they just did something in the Garden of Eden that, that introduced an element into the world which threw things off. It's kind of like they released a virus into the computer and now nothing works right. The files won't open. What was once bright and beautiful and functional became corrupted. Now, we don't know exactly how that happened or what it looked like. Like I said, that's a mystery. But I should point out that whatever you make of like the first few chapters of Genesis, this is not all necessarily Adam and Eve's fault. We can't just blame Adam and Eve for screwing everything up. This is our fault. We are the cause of our own corruption. How does that happen? Well, it happens very slowly as we make one decision that leads to another decision, which leads to another decision. I mean, take your average politician. I don't know a lot of politicians. I know they're not all corrupt, too. I know that's just a stereotype we make to distract ourselves from our own sin. But those that are corrupt, I doubt they went into politics to become corrupt. I mean, this was Senator Payne's story. His idealism ran up against political realities. He just started cutting corners until he kept cutting corners. Eventually, he cut so many corners that he was just running around in moral circles with no sense of right or wrong. But he didn't start out like that. He made small decisions, which led him to make bigger ones. And this is how corruption happens, bit by bit by bit. That's why the book of Deuteronomy warns the Israelites, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt. God is telling the Israelites that small decisions lead to big consequences. Every wrong word you say, every immoral decision you make could lead you down a slippery path of moral compromise. Uh, Many years ago, for example, a friend of mine, uh, he needed some money to uh, pay some bills that had come due. He worked for a large company. He didn't think anybody would notice if he took a few bucks from the cash register. Nobody did notice. He promised himself he would pay it back. Nobody noticed, though. Didn't feel the urgency. Some more bills came due. Grabbed a little bit more money. Took more and more. Eventually, he stole tens of thousands of dollars, at which point he got found out when the police arrived at his door. My friend is a good guy. He just got morally careless. He didn't watch himself carefully and it led him to a place he never thought he'd be. Now, why did that happen in the first place? That moment when he took the money from the the cash register the first time, why did that happen? Because just for a second, just for a second, he stopped believing in God. He stopped believing that God cared for him, that God could take care of him, that God could help him with his bills and that he didn't need to steal any money. And that's ultimately the cause of corruption. Ultimately, the cause of our corruption is our own godlessness. That's why the psalmist writes, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. And their ways are vile. The reason we make corrupt decisions in the first place is because Just for a second, we stop believing in God. The reason we get drunk that one night is because at that moment of decision, we stop believing in God. The reason we say that thing that we know we shouldn't say, you know, the thing that's going to start an argument that we don't want to start, but the reason we say it anyway is because that's that moment when the word may or may not come out of our mouths, we stop believing in God. The reason we overeat or overwork is because we stop believing in God. The cause of our corruption, it's not Adam, it's not Eve, it's our own godlessness. When we sin, we stop believing in God, that he is real and holy and true and good. That's the cause of our corruption. The cause of corruption is our own godlessness. That's the cause. Let's talk about the consequences, though. What are the consequences of corruption? What happens when we give in? What are the consequences? Well, no good thing The simplest answer here is that the consequences of corruption are more corruption. Bad decisions lead to more bad decisions for everybody. The more people there are who make bad decisions, the easier it is for everyone to make bad decisions. If everybody's running the red light, might as well run the red light. 
And in our own lives, the more we give in to corruption, the more corrupt we become. As Paul writes to the Galatians, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap corruption. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap corruption. This is an agricultural farming law. It's the law of returns. People harvest what they plant. You can't plant okra and get corn. If you plant corruption, you'll produce corruption and then more corruption. If you watch pornography, you will watch more pornography and you will have marriage problems. If you gossip about people, people will stop trusting you. You will have friend problems. If you don't eat right, you will get unhealthy. You will have death problems. Corruption produces more corruption. And these corruptions in our lives will affect other people too. One of the most important ideas in the Bible for example, is something known as generational sin. Have you ever heard this phrase before? Generational sin. Generational sin is sin passed down from one generation to the next, and we see it all over the Bible. Children have this tendency to commit the same sins that their parents did. King David had this problem with polygamy and adultery. What do you know? So does Solomon. Abraham has this really weird problem of lying about the identity of his wife. It's a really specific problem. <laughs> lying about the identity of his wife and calling, him, calling her his sister. What do you know? His son Isaac has the exact same specific problem. Lying about the identity of his wife and calling him his sister. This is just a human reality that our corruption gets passed down to our children in sometimes some very specific ways. Science demonstrates this. Alcoholic tendencies get passed down one generation to the next. So does depression. So does mental illness. Family dysfunction gets passed down. People who are abused have a tragic, tragic tendency to become abusers. This is the consequence of corruption, more corruption on down the line. And where does it all lead? It leads to death. Remember what corruption is. Corruption is disintegration. It's when things don't work the way they were supposed to. And eventually those things die. What happens to the computer when it gets corrupted? It dies. The psalmist writes in Psalm 49... The people are like sheep and are destined to die. Their forms will decay in the grave, far from their princely mansions. This is true in a spiritual sense, of course. Our corruption keeps us from God. Our corruption sends us to hell. The consequence of corruption is that we are separated from God and suffer spiritual death. But I also mean this quite literally. Our corruption kills us. Corrupt marriages end in divorce. Corrupt friendships don't last. Corrupt bodies don't last. Corruption kills. You know, for example, that my son had a genetic mutation in his DNA. His DNA was corrupt. His file was corrupt. His body didn't work right. And he died. He would have been graduating from college this weekend from SLU. He didn't. Because his file was corrupt, he died. Corruption kills, literally. What are the causes of corruption? Death. More corruption that gets passed down to others, leading to death. Now it's secure. Is there a solution to this problem? Because it's a big one. Death, not a little problem. Well, there is a cure. Which brings me to my last point. We've talked about the cause of corruption, the consequences of corruption. Now let's talk about the cure. What's the cure? Well, what's the, the cure to government corruption? People who study these things tell us that the cure to government corruption involves two things. Transparency and accountability. Maybe you know that there are these things in our, in our country called sunshine laws. Maybe you know what sunshine laws are. Sunshine laws require that the government not keep too many secrets. Uh, back in 1967, 
Uh, for example, Congressman John Ross from California, uh, he was a little bit of a Jefferson Smith uh, in his day. He actually thought that the government had too many secrets. So he spent 15 years trying to pass the Freedom of Information Act, which gave the public greater access to government information. The logic here was that if the government knows they're being watched, they will be less likely to do immoral things. If politicians know they might get voted out of office for behaving badly, they might behave better. Now, of course, this assumes that the public cares about political corruption. We can't necessarily assume that anymore. Like I said, the reasons we elect corrupt officials is because we're kind of corrupt. And I hate to say it, but a lot of Americans just don't care about character in their leaders anymore. This applies to Christians, too. A lot of Christians don't care about character in our leaders anymore. We might have at one point. We might have when, like, Bill Clinton was in office. But not anymore. We just want someone to get things done for us. But even if we don't care about corruption, even if we don't care about character, here's the thing. God really does what did he do when he looked down on the earth and he saw that all things were corrupt? What did he do? He destroyed it. The whole thing. He flooded it. God cares. And here's the other thing. He still does. And he's going to destroy it again because we are just as corrupt as we have ever been. We are 25th on the corrupt scale and fallen fast. But God doesn't want to do that. God doesn't want to destroy us or send us to hell. He's a God of judgment, but he's also a God of love. So what did he do? What did God do? He sent preachers and prophets and apostles. That's what Noah was. Noah was a preacher announcing to everybody the coming wrath of God. He sent Peter, the lead apostle. This is what Peter even announces in his big speech in Acts 2. Here's what Peter pleads. Peter pleads, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Save yourselves. Why? Because we live in a corrupt world and it's all going to burn. Save yourselves from the fire. Now, how do we save ourselves? Well, he goes on. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the cure for our corruption. The cure for corruption is the repentance of sins. It's admitting that we're sinners. It's bringing our sin to light. It's not living in the dark anymore. It's telling a pastor or a friend or a brother or a sister that we've got a corruption problem. This is what sunshine laws require us to do. Sunshine laws shine light on corruption. That's the only way to be healed of our corruption is to bring it to the sunshine. It's to confess it. If you've got a lying problem, confess it. If you've got a gambling problem, confess it. If you've got a bitterness problem, confess it. If you've got a laziness problem, confess it. Bring it to the light. Why? So you can be embarrassed? So you can be humiliated? Voted out of office? No, so you can be healed. Book of James says that we can, should confess our sins to one another. Why? So that we can make fun of each other? Oh my gosh, that's terrible. No, so that we can pray for each other and be healed. And so that we could be forgiven. You see, God hates corruption. But he can forgive it. He wants to. And he provides the means by which we can be. Think of it like this. Uh, there's an old saying that you may have heard recommending what we should do with corrupt politicians. What should we do? We should throw the bums out. So my grandma and grandpa always used to say, around election time, throw the bums out. Better yet, lock them up. I think people even still chant this. Lock her up, lock her up. This is what we know needs to happen with corrupt politicians. They need to be locked up, they need to be thrown out. But if we understand the reality of sin, this includes us. We're the bums. We need to be thrown out. We need to be locked up. But who's going to chant that? Lock us up. Lock us up. Even though it's far more theologically appropriate. We need to be locked up. When we die, the last place we deserve to be is in heaven. We need to be locked up. We're the bums. 
God doesn't want that, though. God loves us too much just to let that happen. So he made a way. He came to earth as a man. He was crucified on a cross. Jesus got thrown out. Got, Jesus got locked up on the cross. This is what happened. He went to prison. This is what they did to criminals back then. He went to prison for our corruption. He suffered the wrath of the voters. He got impeached, got removed from office. It should have been us. He took the fall. He did the time. And now, thanks be to God, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus took on our corruption. He took on our condemnation. And Jesus gives us life in freedom. Not freedom to continue living in our corrupt ways. Freedom to love. Freedom to serve. Freedom to pray. Freedom to live. 